Good morning. Glad you all didn't get blown away yesterday. Thought we were in Kansas. It was crazy here yesterday. Lost lots of trees in our yard. Just glad you guys are all here safe and sound. Welcome to the Clarence Church of Christ. We're so glad you're all here with us. If you're at home, we miss you. Thanks for tuning in. If you guys could all stand and turn in your hymnals to page 104. It came upon a midnight clear. Page 108, the first Noel.
Please remain standing. Today we light the third candle, the pink candle. It's known as the shepherd's candle or the candle of joy. The shepherds received a message of joy and it's written in Luke 2, 7 through 15. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in the manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to all on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Look down from the sky 
like shouting joy to the world. Hotel in the over the hills and everywhere go. Tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go. Tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. It's Christmas. The angels are singing. I know the reason the Savior is born. It's Christmas, bells are ringing, and I feel like shouting joy to the world. Joy to the world. Joy to the world. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to read three passages of Scripture as we begin our prayer time this morning. I'm going to read from... Micah in the Old Testament from the book of James in the New Testament and from 1 John. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. From the book of James, chapter 1, verse 27, we hear this. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And lastly, from 1 John, chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Did you catch the theme there? It's clear from Scripture that we are to live out our obedience to God, at least one way we are to live out our obedience to God, is by showing love and generosity to those who are in need. One way, and just one of the ways that we do that as a church, is through the Christmas Giving Project each year. So as we prepare to celebrate Jesus' birth and share gifts with each other and our families, I hope that you will consider helping us to extend a helping hand to families who are struggling with meeting their material needs this season. So if you can help, I encourage you to see Nikki after service today. I'm, I'm sure there's plenty still to be done. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, it is so good to be here this morning to worship you. Um, to be thankful to you for the love and generosity that you've shown to us. We thank you, Father, for how you have shown that love and patience and mercy to us through, uh, through Jesus, whose birth we celebrate this season, recognizing, of course, that he grew into a man who uh, served you completely as your son in this world and who sacrificed himself on the cross for us paid the price for our sins and the ultimate act of generosity to us. Father, we know that it is um, a troubling aspect of our world that some of us have more material blessings than others. Uh, this time of year, Father, I pray that, especially pray that you would help us to shine your light of love to others 
by being generous with our material possessions. I pray, Father, you'd be with our church this season. Help us to extend your love to those in need in such a way that they will be um, uh, just impressed and awed by your love for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand and sing with us.
be seated. Morning, everybody. Welcome. I'm very glad that you're here today for a lot of reasons. Uh, well, we began to think about what we were going to do for Christmas and the theme for Christmas sermons. Uh, I settled on the subject of peace, uh, peace with God, peace in my heart, peace with each other, and wanted to share those messages with uh, Mitch and with Jordan, that they would help develop that theme, not knowing that I was going to be uh, off chasing the wild goose in Ohio trying to take care of my dad. So I missed last Sunday, although I was worshiping with you uh, later on, via the internet. Today, Mitch is going to share a message with you on the subject of peace. And it's, uh, he's the right guy, right time, right place, in my opinion, because every year at Christmas time, we know people are remembering the year and they're starting to do Christmas without loved ones who have been here with them for a long, long time. And now maybe this is their first Christmas without them. And also issues seem to be magnified in our lives at Christmas time. You know, why is this happening at Christmas? That kind of stuff. And it just seems to me that uh, Mitch will tell some of his story, but his story I think will match yours. And I thought about it this week and thought about it through the night and prayed with him this morning. I want to pray right now and then ask Mitch to come up and share what the Lord's put on his heart with you today. Father in heaven, thank you so much for a church family that loves each other and puts you first. Um, we aren't all we want to be, Father, but we're trying hard. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who is in us, moving us, teaching us, comforting us helping us become more like you. We just commit this message to you right now. May your Holy Spirit make it better than it is in Mitch's preparation. Would you give him peace and boldness just to share what's on his heart? Would you use this to encourage your people and bring great honor to your name is my prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Hi, everybody. Is this thing on? Good. Thanks for being here today. I hope you're doing well. I hope those tuning in from home are also doing well. I just wanted to take a minute here at the beginning and uh, express my concern for the decision making of Mike Jordan and the Board of Elders because for some reason they thought it would be a good idea for me to get up here and speak and preach a second time. Now, I can only assume that they would want me to do this because they want people to leave their church. Um, if that's the case, then you know what? They got to own it. Um, but as a result, I'm just warning you, I might be violating your Eighth Amendment right this morning against cruel and unusual punishment. If you do have a problem with my performance, please be sure to, uh, to submit a formal written complaint to the Board of Elders. I'm sure they have nothing better to do with their time than to uh, read your angry letters. So. so we're currently in a sermon series called Peace on Earth. Now last week, Jordan did a great job kicking us off and teaching us how all peace originates and is connected to the life and birth of Jesus. But this week I wanted us to focus in a little bit harder on what biblical inner peace or peace of mind looks like. Now I don't think it takes a very long look at our reality to understand that we are not at peace with ourselves. We're not at peace in our minds and we're not at peace with our situations and our circumstances. And if you don't believe me, I've got a few statistics to share with you. So according to addictioncenters.com, 300 million people around the world suffer from alcoholism, which includes 15 million Americans. According to a USA Today study and survey, Americans on average will spend $18,000 a year frivolously on non-essential items. And lastly, according to a University of Pennsylvania study, it shows that we're only happier based on the more money we make in a given year with the happiest people being those who make $75,000 a year or more. Go figure. 
See, guys, if we were so at peace, why would we feel the need to self-medicate with substances like alcohol or some kind of other drug? If we, were at so peace, if we were so at peace with ourselves, why would we feel the need to participate in the retail therapy we see around us? Why would we lie to ourselves and tell us, if I just had this one product or this one service, I could finally rest easy? And if we were so at peace, why would we give in to the workaholism that we see in our culture and tie our value directly to the amount of money we make in a given year? See, stats like this don't show me people who are at peace with themselves. Stats like this only reaffirm my belief that we are not at peace with ourselves, that we're naturally anxious and unsatisfied, we're discontent and we have a lack of something. We have a God-shaped hole in our heart that we're desperate to do whatever it takes to fill. But the reality is no amount of control we use over our situation, our circumstances, or even our own lives is going to bring us peace of mind. Peace of mind is only going to come when we surrender our control to the Lord. Peace of mind comes when we surrender our control to the Lord. Now in our culture, I think it's easy for us to find ourselves stressed or anxious because of the conflict, the strife, the divisiveness, and the chaos that surrounds us on a day-to-day -day basis, and because of the stressful situations that we find ourselves in. And when it comes to things like stress or anxiety, I think we're really good at putting on a brave face and saying, well, being stressed is just a part of life. I got to deal with it. I got to keep moving forward. It's whatever. I'm a man. I can take it. But I think deep down we know that we would much rather surrender those burdens to somebody else. Because if we're being honest with ourselves, we know that our anxiety and our stress can overwhelm and overtake us. And because of the conflict and the strife that's around us and the stressful situations that we find ourselves in, it could be easy to think that peace of mind or inner peace is impossible to get. But it's actually in those circumstances and in the stressful situations, in the chaos and in the trouble, that God wants to make himself known to us. And it's where our surrender of our control to him can happen. Guys, every Christmas we have the unique opportunity to celebrate the birth of Jesus, which is the fullness of this idea that God doesn't want to remain a mystery to us, that he wants to make himself known, and that he wants to do life with us. But we know that his desire to make himself known wasn't just hidden until the time of Jesus' birth. It was shown time and time again in the Old Testament. And this Christmas season, I'm asking you to take a small journey with me back in time to one of the stories in the Old Testament about three men who, under the rule of their king, found true peace of mind in one of the most stressful situations I can imagine. So now this is the part where I'm going to invite you to turn to the scripture for today. It's uh, Daniel chapter 3. Uh, whether that's on your physical Bible, on your phone, uh, or just following on the slides behind me, or just listening, whatever it is, I just invite you to listen close uh, and let God's word speak to you. So, some context for this story, just before it and during it. We know that God desired a deep relationship with his people, but they were unfaithful and disobedient to him. And as a result, they became scattered. This was the third year of the reign King Jehoiakim from the tribe of Judah when Nebuchadnezzar came in and besieged Jerusalem and he took it over. But he didn't just do that. He decided to take four men from the royal line of Judah into his service. Some names you might recognize, including the prophet Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And to them he gave them new names, respectively Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Very common names we give our kids nowadays, right? And those last three names are names we're going to be hearing a lot more often as we go through this chapter. So let's start from verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. 
As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. All right, so pause for a second. So if you're in Christ this morning, when you hear a command like that, you might feel a little bit of a twinge in your chest. As far as our God is concerned, Nebuchadnezzar is inviting his people to participate in idolatry. And all idolatry is, is worshiping something as God in God's place. Now, I just mentioned a little bit ago how we think it could be hard for us to find peace of mind or inner peace in the stressful situations that we have to deal with. So put yourself, as you are today, under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar when a command like this is issued. What's going through your mind? See, I think this would be a stressful situation if there ever was one, way beyond the scope of anything that we have to deal with today. You would have a choice to either be obedient to your earthly king or to your heavenly father. And no matter what you chose, there'd be severe consequences. And like us, three Jewish men had a choice to make. So continuing from verse 8. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. And what God will be able to save you from my hand? All right, pause for another second. What do you think is going through the, mind, the minds of these three men right now? Now, I don't know because the scripture's silent on that, but I'm a human being as much as they are, and I've got some guesses. I would guess that they might be, at least a little bit, stressed or anxious at the thought of being burned alive because of their faith. Would you? You think they might be at least a little bit tempted to do whatever it takes to get out of the problem of that situation and to avoid the trouble of the blazing furnace. You think just once they would be tempted to bow down and avoid the trouble that was headed their way. See, in the middle of their own chaos, in the middle of this stressful situation, these men found true inner peace and peace of mind, and they took the first step to that peace by asking themselves a very simple question. Who is going to handle this situation better? Me or the Lord? And we get the answer to that continuing on from verse 16 to the end. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into a blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with rage. He was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men tied up that we threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god but their own god. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So despite the stress and the anxiety of the situation, which I'm sure there was a lot of, these men decided to give control of the situation to the Lord. They found peace of mind by doing that. They decided that their Lord would be better at handling the situation than they would. Now I've got to ask you a question. When's the last time you prayed to God and he didn't answer your prayer request in the exact way you wanted him to? Did you get frustrated, angry? We've all been there. But these men had such great faith that even if God didn't do exactly what they wanted him to do, they were still willing to give him the steering wheel of the situation. These men surrendered their control to him wholly, and they found real biblical peace of mind. They were at peace with themselves and their situation because they decided not to handle it themselves. Now to us, willingly surrendering to something like a blazing furnace can seem like the opposite of peace of mind. But according to the scriptures, and God's word says it better than anybody, this is exactly what peace of mind looks like. Peace of mind is not going to come from God removing the threat of a blazing furnace in your life. Peace of mind is only going to come when God decides to enter the furnace with you. So one more time, I'm going to ask you to put yourself in the shoes of these three men. Now we know that hindsight's 2020, and it's easy for us to paint ourselves as the hero who would do everything right. But could you honestly say, in a stressful situation like this, that you wouldn't be the least bit anxious or stressed, and you wouldn't be the least bit tempted to do whatever it takes to get out of the threat of the furnace? Do you do that with other stressful situations in your life? I know I do. When I get stressed or anxious, one of my first things is micromanaging and white-knuckling the steering wheel of the situation. You see, even if we don't say it out loud, I think we know that sometimes we think we could do a better job than God could. And again, we won't say that, but our actions speak louder than our words. Now, again, you know, I mentioned this last time I preached, but you might be sitting out there and saying, okay, well... Thanks, mail order pastor, for the guilt trip. Like, do you have anything else you want to say? Or, and I do. And it's not a guilt trip. Like I said, I'm guilty of all of these things that I presented to you today. As soon as things get stressful or anxious, I will take control of the situation. And I can tell you, every time I do that, it does not go well. Now, we all don't have the threat of a literal blazing furnace like these three men did. But each of us this morning does have a blazing furnace we have to deal with, I assure you. Let me tell you a little bit about mine. When my furnace was heated seven times hotter than usual on October 27th of 2020, the day prior I just celebrated my 25th birthday, and on the 27th at around 4 p.m., I get a call from my mother, crying and short of breath, who just simply says, 
Dad passed away. She let me know that he lost his 10-year battle with alcoholism. And I knew right then that I had two choices. I could walk into the furnace by myself, or I could walk into the furnace with God at my back. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and act perfect, like I've done everything exactly right or according to plan. There are still times where I'll get stressed out, and I'll take control. And I can tell you, every time I do it, I'll fail and falter and fall flat on my face. But I can tell you that whenever I surrender the control of this furnace to the Lord, I experience peace of mind like none other. And I would encourage you to do the same. What furnace are you dealing with this morning? Maybe it's alcohol or some kind of substance. Maybe it's the stress and the trauma that comes from the death of a loved one. Maybe it's financial trouble or unemployment. Maybe it's problems in your workplace, a toxic work environment, or an overbearing boss. Maybe it's broken relationships that you're desperate to mend. Whatever it is, you have a choice as much as these three men had a choice. You can either handle it yourself or you can let God handle it for you. And God does want to handle it for you. And the reason I know that is because of the very season we're celebrating. Christmas is a time where we celebrate the fact that God literally wanted to enter into our conflict. He was born as a man by humbling himself, being born of a virgin into a manger, to literally enter into our messed up reality, to do life with us, to walk alongside us, to encourage us, to teach us, and to love us. He wants to fight your battle. I promise you that. He's done it for me, and he can do it for you. So everything I've said this morning reminds me of a friend that I um, made at a men's barbecue out at Fredonia. He works at the city mission now in Dunkirk. He went overseas and was in the military and unfortunately watched his best friend at 19 years of age get gunned down before his eyes. Now, he came back from overseas and obviously had a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder. And he went to a social worker and was there referred to a psychiatrist, I think, and ended up literally being put on 20 different medications. And he's the first to tell you that that really messed him up. And it wasn't until he switched social workers to a woman who openly professed her Christian faith that he heard something he had never heard before in his lifetime. She said, it's okay to give up. And he fought that tooth and nail with every fiber of his being. He said, I was not raised that way. Giving up is wrong. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And she's like, yeah, but who's telling you that? It's broken people. What's their track record? With Jesus, you don't have to put on a show. He can handle it for you. And from there, he got off his medications, and the whole trajectory of his life changed. And guys, I think it's worth mentioning that these three men in the Old Testament found peace of mind outside of the time of the promised Messiah. So how much more are we going to experience peace of mind living in the resurrection age that we are? So what steps can you do to surrender your control to the Lord and receive your peace of mind? Well, first, I would ask that you would celebrate the birth of your Lord and Savior Jesus, who is willing to act as a mediator between himself and his Father. In short, I'm just telling you to pray. Prayer is so powerful, and it's the first step of our surrender. Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, present your request before God. And then the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And when God answers your request in the exact way you want him to, then you will feel peace of mind that surpasses all understanding. It doesn't say that. We need to give the entire situation over to him. We need to let him know that we trust him with the steering wheel of our lives. Another step, celebrate the birth of your Lord and Savior Jesus who allows you 
to have control over your own thoughts. This comes from 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. If you are in Christ, you call the shots of your own mind. Nobody else. So when you notice yourself obsessing or ruminating, take the thought before Jesus. Surrender that burden to Jesus. Lastly, I want you to celebrate the birth of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this Christmas season, who is a Lord that is willing to fight our battles for us. 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And the word cast in the original language means to violently throw. We have a Lord that loves us so much that he is willing for our burdens to be violently thrown on his back. Guys, peace of mind is only going to come when you surrender your control to the Lord. Now, this is my least favorite part about speaking, where I have to tell you that if you're outside of Christ this morning, you have no shot at peace of mind because you're not at peace with God himself. Commit yourself to the principles of discipleship that you see in his word. Deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow after him. And in that posture and spirit, rise and be baptized, washing away your sins and calling on his name. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for this day. Um, thank you for this, these people that are here this morning. Father, please soften their heart to this message. Please soften their heart to the story of these three men who found true peace by surrendering, surrendering their control to you. Father, we confess to you that we're really good at controlling the circumstances of our lives, but the results that come from that are not good. Father, this morning, whatever our burdens are, we give it to you, and we ask that you would take care of it for us. Father, this Christmas season, Please be with the hearts of the people that are here this morning and let them know that you want to fight their battles for them. We pray this to you in Jesus' name and by the power of your spirit. Amen. Trials, all your worries and your burdens. There's a 
Savior and He calls, bring it all to the table. Bring it all. You can bring it all. All your sins, all your sorrow and your sadness There's a Savior and He calls Bring it all to the table All your sin, all your sorrow and your sadness There's a Savior and He calls Bring it all to the table Merriam-Webster, the dictionary people, has just come out with 520 new words this year that they are adding to their next edition. Some are familiar, air fryer, for instance. Some reflect COVID times, wet market, super spreader, or long hauler, a person who experiences long-term effects from COVID-19. Did you know postpartum women now are experiencing a fourth trimester following delivery? Or that ghost kitchens, non-restaurant-based commercial cooking facilities are popping up in different locations. Fluffer Nutter made the list, although I thought that had been around for decades. And don't want to waste precious breath? Use the abbreviation TBH instead of to be honest. Say, men, are you a silver fox? An attractive, middle-aged man mostly having gray or white hair? <laughs> no? Then perhaps the term dad bod applies. A dad bod is the typical physique of an average father, slightly overweight and not especially muscular. <laughs> yeah. Words come and go. Language is dynamic, as seen in these examples. Then there are words that seem to have faded from existence. The word propitiation is one of those words. Propitiation is the act of gaining or regaining the favor or goodwill of someone or something. It means to appease or placate another. It is more than an apology, as it typically involves doing something to earn forgiveness or redemption. Think about a boy mowing his neighbor's lawn for two months after breaking a window playing baseball. The term appears several times in the King James Version of the New Testament. In Romans 3, 24 and 25 it reads, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare righteousness for the remission of sins that are, that are past, through the forbearance of God. The NIV translates the term as a sacrifice of atonement. In 1 John 2, 2, again in the King James, Christ is called the propitiation for our sins. The NIV states, 
He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Circling back, TBH, I can better relate to the term atoning sacrifice than propitiation. Whether I fully understand it, however, is another matter. As Jim Walker would say, we can apprehend it, but we can't comprehend it, at least not on this side of heaven. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. We take this time now to reflect on Jesus' atoning sacrifice on the cross that appeased God and earned us back into his favor. Father, we stand before you at this table, invited by your Son, who would take upon himself the cross and climb that hill to die such a horrible death in our place. We can apprehend it, but we can't comprehend it. The love that he had for us, the love that he shares with us, the spirit that as a result is given to us to go likewise into the world to sacrifice ourselves so that others may be found in favor with you again. We ask this all through your son's holy name. Amen.
took the fall and thought of me We're glad you could join us for worship today. We just want to point your attention to a few things. Uh, first is the Christmas giving project. You notice in the table in the back, there's a lot of items that are starting to pile up, and that's good to see. Uh, we encourage you to check with Nikki Langworthy before you leave today just to see what items we still might need and uh, what, how else you might be able to contribute to blessing those who are in need at this time of year. Uh, and then we encourage you to be a part of packing and distributing it on December 19th. There is a new opportunity for ladies to have fellowship and Bible study. That's going to be starting Thursday, January 6th, and Linda Cronin is going to be organizing that. So I encourage you to connect with her if that's something you'd like to be a part of. And that's going to be at 10 a.m. here in the building on Thursdays. Also, there's a men's opportunity to fellowship and uh, be encouraged. A steak dinner that Juan Santiago and the men of the church are trying to organize as well. That's going to be January 14th. Uh, that's here as well, 6.30 to 8.30. There's information in your info page. You can see that as well. Also, if you didn't get an info page, they're on the table on your way out. I encourage you to pick one up there as well. And then lastly, uh, Christmas Eve, our uh, service will be at 7 p.m. So just note that is the time to show up and we'll celebrate the birth of Christ and his arrival on at that time. Mitch, thank you for taking of your time to share and prepare and all the thoughts you put into uh, sharing with us this morning. We appreciate that. As you leave this morning, we um, know that we go in the good news that Jesus truly has brought peace on earth. And he's given us peace of mind in doing so. And it, but it's only in and through him. And we have that good news to cling to. Would you join us for one more song as we close? Christ is born. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. It's Christmas. The angels are singing. I know the reason. The Savior is Bless everyone. <laughs>